Welcome to Airborne at Oshkosh for Tuesday, July 30th. I'm Ashley Hale. Coming up on today's edition of Airborne, Stimmy introduces its new touring motor glider. Flight design is progressing on the C4, and Able Flight pins wings on six new pilots. These stories and more on this edition of Airborne. <laughs> Stimmy introduced a new motor glider, the Grand Touring S6, at a press conference on Tuesday. Tom Patton is here to report. Stimmy introduced the S6 Grand Tour motor glider at Oshkosh this week. Alexander Pappenberg, CEO of Stemi, says the airplane is geared toward people who want to go comfortably and quickly, but also had the capabilities of a motor glider. Pappenberg said the S6 will cruise at 125 to 135 knots with a top speed of 145 knots at 9,000 feet. The S6 has a Rotax 914 turbocharged engine, retractable gear, and electric feathering prop. It carries 44 pounds of baggage. The S6 starts at $390,000 and is currently in production. At Whitman Regional Airport in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, for Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. When we come back, flight design is progressing toward certification of its four-place C4. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. The Evolution Flight Display System from Aspen Avionics delivers unique reliability and safety features to GA pilots and is truly the most flexible and affordable EFIS available. Aspen Avionics, a new way to look at avionics. Pipistrel's innovative new Alpha Trainer has been designed from the ground up for flying school operations. Powered by a Rotax 80 horsepower engine, the Alpha burns only 2.5 U.S. gallons of fuel per hour at 100 to 108 knots, giving you the opportunity to make flight training cost-effective once again. Be sure to check out the Pipistrel Alpha when you're ready to select your next trainer. Get more info at pipistrel-usa.com. Concorde Platinum Series batteries are available for all aircraft and offer extra cranking power, resulting in less draw on the battery per cycle for longer life. Visit booth 2053 at Oshkosh. Concorde, for the heart of your aircraft. Make the right choice. Fit a Trig TT31 Mode S transponder. It's the easiest plug-and-play retrofit to the KT76A. Install a Trig tray and it's ADS-B out capable too. Trig. Smart. Affordable. And future-proof. You're watching Airborne on Aero TV from AirVenture 2013. Stepping away from Oshkosh news for a moment, but still news that will be very welcome here at Whitman Regional Airport. The U.S. Senate Commerce Committee passed the Small Aircraft Revitalization Act by a voice vote on Tuesday afternoon. A similar bill recently unanimously passed the U.S. House of Representatives. The bill would require the FAA to implement the recommendations of the FAA's Part 23 Reorganization Aviation Rulemaking Committee by December 31, 2015. Adopting the ARC's recommendations would help the FAA meet its stated goal of doubling safety levels and cutting certification costs in half for the lighter end of the general aviation marketplace. Quicksilver announced Tuesday that they are finalizing work on their special light sport aircraft model. They are waiting on an audit from the FAA to confirm the procedure before deliveries can commence. Quicksilver is working simultaneously to gain approval on two models, the Sport 2S open cockpit and the closed or partially closed cockpit GT500. Each is a two-seat model. By the end of the year, Quicksilver Aeronautics expects to be able to offer two special LSA plus experimental LSA kit models and 51% EAB models for its entire line of seven aircraft models. Flight Design is working on occupant safety for its four-place C4. Initiated by Norlin Northern Lightweight Design Network of Hamburg, Germany, and with the C4 as the initial project, development funding has been granted to the Project Safety Box through the German Ministry of Economics and Technology. 
Flight Design Technical Director Oliver Reinhardt described the concept as being like a Formula One racer, where a monocoque cage protects the driver and other structures absorb the forces of impact. Flight Design CEO Matthias Betch said a prototype C4 should be ready to display next year. Coming up, part two of our interview with EAA Chairman Jack Pelton. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. 295 and counting. That's the number of lives saved so far by the revolutionary BRS airframe parachute. See and read why BRS can keep you safe at www.brsparachutes.com. Cubcrafters is unique in that we can design, prototype, and certify and put into production an aircraft. There aren't very many companies in the world that can make that claim. This AeroCast is sponsored by ForeFlight, makers of intelligent iPhone and iPad apps for pilots. Visit ForeFlight.com to see and hear more about ForeFlight Mobile. With best-in-class design, touch planning, brilliant pre-flight and in-flight weather displays, and backed by fanatical pilot support, ForeFlight Mobile is aviation's most popular app. Bright, light, and affordable. Sandia Aerospace presents the STX-165 Mode AC Transponder. Check it out at www.sandia.aero. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird X-Wind SE and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulation.com. One of the projects we've been working on behind the scenes at ANN is one we hope will bring many new faces into aviation. ANN's Jim Campbell held a press conference Tuesday to introduce the concept to Oshkosh. Jim is here to report. Well, like the Cub Crafters behind me, the LSA community has been all the rage over the last few years. As a result, the Sport Plane Resource Guide that we have done over the last couple of decades is now being recompiled, if you will, in an electronic format. The next Sport Plane Resource Guide will be available in four volumes and will be coming out over the next year. In addition, though, we're going to be introducing a book called Aerosports. Fifteen of the major sport aviation activities will be discussed, examined, and profiled in no uncertain terms so that people who are interested in getting into sport aviation now have the information to be able to get their start. We're going to try to rebuild sport aviation, one aviator, one aerosport at a time. For the Aero News Network, Airborne and Aero TV, I'm Jim Campbell, and please buy my book. Now let's turn to the second part of Jim's interview with EAA Chair Jack Pelton. In this segment of the interview, Pelton discusses his first year at the helm of the EAA and how it differs from his days at Cessna. What's the workflow like now? Have things become more comfortable, more productive? They're certainly more. They're more collaborative. They're more productive. There's a... a, a a definite air of a more openness of people uh, believing that there's trust and that there's uh, the type of organization that you would hope would be a, one you'd want to be a part of, which has been very, very positive. One of the things that obviously was a challenge for Rod Hightower was he was walking into what had been a family business. Was that family business atmosphere or attitude still present when you walked in? Everybody characterized it outside of EA as being a family business, and, and there there certainly was the attributes of the Pobreznis who, with Paul founding it and Tom taking the reins in place, but the organization runs on the shoulders of those people who are here that know their specialties and skills. I would say that there was a, a need to balance the business aspect versus the membership association organization side. And that's a kind of a unique skill set to be able to, to do that. We have a fiduciary responsibility as a nonprofit to stay on track with our mission of education for youth aviation. But we also have to make sure that we have enough revenue so that we can continue to fund those kinds of programs. So you have to have some business acumen to be able to not run it off the, off the rails. You came from running Cessna Aircraft and through a period of time of exceptional change and obviously <laughs> better conditions that we're enjoying right now. How would you compare the skill sets that you employed at Cessna 
leading it through a, a number of transitions, a number of changes, and of course, some real interesting uh, labor issues there and so forth. How would you compare then to now in running AAA? There's a lot of parallels, and, and my career, having only been in aviation with Douglas Aircraft, which had a history, had a tradition, had multiple generations of people working there, moving to Cessna, identical, same situation, and then EA, which was very similar, except it has the volunteerism side, the member and the nonprofit side to it. One of the things that I learned along the way, a journey for all the places I've, I've been, is that especially at Cessna, that when I came in steeped in history, steeped in great leadership, I mean, when you look at Clyde, Duane, Russ Meyer, and then having to step in after them, the recognition of the culture, the appreciation of the culture, really recognizing that 80 years at Cessna, they, they did do a lot of things right, so you don't need to go in there and try to churn things up and change them and be the guy with all the answers. So stepping into EA, I did a lot of the similar as far as listening, understanding, and trying to preserve what got us to where we are today, and then fine-tune the other pieces. This could be one of the more pivotal Oshkosh's uh, air ventures, pardon me, I'm old school here, uh, for at least the last decade, if not beyond. One, what are you looking forward to most from a traction and value standpoint? And two, what do you think this particular fly-in may accomplish? When you say it's, it's pivotal, um, you know, it is in the sense of we're trying to rebuild the confidence in the aviation community that EA is something that they should be a part of. So I, I respect and, and will take that challenge that it is and that we had this leadership change. You can't continue to go on in the fashion this. But I think there's, there's other things out there that make it pivotal in that the economy hasn't recovered in the aviation sector like we thought it would by now. I mean, I remember sitting at Cessna in 2010 and, you know, analysts saying, gosh, this is just awful. When's it going to be back? And all of the forecasts were 2014, 2015, we'd be back to the glorious highs in, in aviation, which means you'd already be on the upslope. And we certainly haven't seen that the last couple of years. So this year is, I think, very important at Oshkosh for people to see what is really going on in the aviation world. Are we seeing recovery? Are companies being created? Is there innovation going on? Or are people just hanging on for survival? And is there going to be fewer in the next couple of years? So that part is pivotal. And I hope we will see some signs of stability. One of our early indicators is we're very proud this year, and we haven't talked about it yet to anybody outside, is we have more exhibitors this year than we've had any other year. So that's a big milestone for us to say, hmm, maybe things are stabilizing. We're hoping from a pivotal year that we're also trying to change it up a little bit, and that will be seen with the military not being here. Not that Oshkosh was really ever much of a military presence, but we're trying to show the variety of what's going on. And I mean, everything from a the ultimate home builder, Jetman, to Terrafuga with the flying car, giving a, a display and a lot more variety of what will actually be seen in the air, which I think is important. And then I think you'll see on the grounds themselves, a lot of companies that are feeling better about their position and the displays are nicer and the activity level is going to be a lot higher. We'll have more of that interview in tomorrow's edition of Airborne. Coming up, Able Flight honors pilots who have overcome unique challenges in order to learn how to fly. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Waco Classic Aircraft now offers the Great Lakes 2T1A2. Inspired by the classic YMF-5D, it's smaller but with 180 horsepower, simpler avionics, and fully aerobatic. Waco lets you fly simply for the fun of it. www.wacoaircraft.com Free Flight, the Texas-based company that pioneered the first certified WAS GPS receiver, designs and manufactures high-performance avionics, delivering substantial benefits from the next-gen airspace transformation. Learn more at www.freeflightsystems.com. Each year at Oshkosh, Able Flight honors pilots who have overcome physical disabilities to learn how to fly. This year, six newly minted pilots received their wings at a ceremony held in Phillips 66 Plaza Tuesday morning. 
Able Flight's mission is to help people with significant physical disabilities, uh, people that are paraplegics, quadriplegics, people that have birth issues, uh, wounded veterans, to help them become pilots or have careers in aviation. Each year we have a wings pinning ceremony here at Air Venture. Receiving their wings today were Dennis Akins of Texas. Uh, Dennis was paralyzed in a trampoline accident when he was 14. He's a quadriplegic and we came up with some special controls that worked for the airplane with him. Young Choi of California, in his native Korea, he got polio when it was already eradicated here in the States. But he's a U.S. citizen, a father, a passionate about aviation. He went through our program really beautifully. Warren Cleary of Georgia. Warren was a professional skydiver. He was injured in a skydiving accident as he was preparing for a world meet. And he's now a pilot through his training at Purdue University. He also serves as a peer mentor to other people with spinal cord injuries. That's one of the things we look at, is what are they doing to give back to other people. Deirdre Dacey of Massachusetts had multiple sclerosis, uh, diagnosed at age 16, and by 20 she was in a wheelchair. So she's been in a wheelchair for about 30 years. No aviation background whatsoever. She came to this from square one. She struggled, she worked hard, she had set records for training, and she got her license this summer as well. Stephanie Glassing of Georgia was injured in an auto accident in high school and she started training with us back in 2007 and then became ill. And this happened several times over the period of the last six years or so that she would become ill, do a little training, become seriously ill. Several times she really, frankly, almost died. This past year she got well, she went back into training, she finished and got her license to become our sixth woman pilot and Deirdre is our seventh. Marine Lieutenant Andrew Kynard was a Naval Academy graduate in 2005 and Andrew had the option of becoming a Marine aviator at that point, but he chose to lead troops on the ground. Five weeks into his first deployment in Iraq, a remotely triggered IED took both of his legs well above the knee. Andrew survived a lot of surgeries, a lot of rehab, he became stronger, he started working again, then he applied to us for a scholarship, so now we've made him into that pilot that he didn't become when he left the Naval Academy. People can learn about Able Flight by visiting ableflight.org and for people who want to apply for a scholarship, I suggest they go to the scholarships page, the frequently asked questions page, they'll get a lot of good information, the forms are on there. If they want to support Able Flight, they can go to the donation page. And that's going to do it for Airborne for Tuesday, July 30th. Remember to join us every day for the rest of this week to get all the latest updates on AirVenture 2013. I'm Ashley Hale, thanks for watching.